Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today, we are going to hear about the book Nothing Matters, a feminist critique of postmodernism by Summer Brodrip and Brodrib, and it's discussed by Renata Klein and Susan Hawthorne. So thank you so much, Susan and Renata, and over to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm the Susan Hawthorne part of the pair. Um, I want to begin by respectfully acknowledging the original owners of the land on which we live and uh, we're speaking from. And we're speaking to you from Jury land in far north Queensland. We also acknowledge uh, the many women throughout history who have fought for women's freedom and the freedom of lesbians, often at the cost of their lives. So we're starting today um, with a, a presentation with Summer's biography. Summer is a Canadian radical feminist critic of postmodernism. She worked with the Yukon Women's Association to establish shelter for native and non-native women and was the Canadian contact for the Feminist International Network of Resistance to Reproductive and Genetic Engineering. She received her PhD from the Ontario Institute for Studies of Education, OISA, and taught feminist theory, women's social and political thought at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. It was here that Summer encountered an extreme backlash to her work and her activism. She and other women, academics, postgrads, and undergrads, established the Chile Climate Committee in response to women experiencing discrimination and sexual harassment in the political science department. They found themselves up against the BC Ombudsman, the Human Rights Commission and the Ministry of Women's Equality, as well as the university's equity office. And there's a quote from an editorial in a magazine called The Market which goes, women's lives are being ruined. The students who agreed to form the CCC, the Chile Climate Committee, are having their names and their work dragged through the mud by the male professors of political science faculty. So uh, they, they, in good faith, these women agreed to investigate the climate of the political science department and give its faculty some recommendations on how to improve women's experiences in the department. They did that, and now they're being called liars, feminist police and cop followers, and not just here on the University of Victoria campus or in the pubs downtown and other social gatherings, but in every political science department across the country. So the eight tenured men who were taken to task for discrimination and sexual harassment, not only threatened legal action, they demanded retractions and also an unqualified apology. They did, there was a write up of what happened in Women's Education Day Fund, and um, I'll, that'll be shown later in the list of um, references, external references. They wrote in this article that the professionalization of sexual harassment has provided jobs for all the mice disguised as cats. So we can say see, we can see that Summer was in the vanguard of battling the upcoming harassment of radical feminists that we're now experiencing from the trans lobby. Her career was destroyed during these long proceedings. She'd been put forward for tenure and promotion, but both were retracted. She left the University of Victoria, BC in 2002, and it's very ironic that it was here where the 2016 first chair in transgender studies was inaugurated, funded by the Pritzkers for five years and renewed until 2025. So Summer left academia and now she lives in England, where she publishes fiction under a pseudonym. It's tragic that her promising academic career was stolen from her because of her feminist belief that sexual and other harassment of, of women in universities 
has to be uncovered and stopped. Okay. So in her preface, um, Soma states clearly what her book is about. It, quote, focuses on the masculinity of postmodernist post-structural theory and the text considered central to its debates. She also adds that the deep misogyny of all its participants is, quote, not peripheral. And indeed, a close reading of Nothing Matters shows beyond doubt how central misogyny and sexism are. Postmodern theory either ignores women completely or as texts without context and without authors. That postmodern theory robs women of our bodies is a good summary of an important theme in Nothing Matters. In order to know what Sommer is talking mm -hmm. about, or rather who Sommer is talking about in Nothing Matters, we put the main pro protagonists here on the PowerPoint that you can see. And I'm just going to go through it really quickly. The three main ones are definitely the two Jacques, Jacques Lacan, Jacques Derrida, and then Michel Foucault. But there are a lot of others that are repeatedly mentioned by practically all of them. Nietzsche is a favorite of all of them, and the Marquis de Sade. Then anthropologist and structuralist Claude Levi Strauss also has a starring role, and Jean Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir also are quite frequently uh, mentioned. Can you get to the next slide, please? Um, so, but then there's some other very unsavory characters like Louis Althusser. He strangled his wife, Ellen Rittman, in 1980. Gilles Deleuze, who is not very prominent, thank God. And then Jean-Francois Lyotard um, had a very important exhibition in the Paris uh, in Paris in 1985, Les Immaterials, and we go, get to that at the very end, actually, of the talk. Jean Bourriard, and they both call themselves postmodernists. And then Sigmund Freud and Karl Marx are also thrown in and discussed occasionally. Then the next slide, please, Joe. And then, of course, not to say that there are no women around. There are three women who try to be part of the boys' club. All three are psychoanalysts, which is an important point. Luz Irigaray, Hélène Sixus, and Julia Kristeva. And they're all still alive, so they're actually surviving the boys. Mind you, they were born a bit later. Um, but they're not great friends of radical feminists either. Um, take the slide off, Joe. In her introduction, which she calls The Labyrinth, Sommer summarizes what all the masters of discourse, and that is her term, say about women. To speak like a woman demands a great deal of sophistication, which is, quote, clearly best left to men. That obviously sounds familiar to us. So that's what they do, speaking for women, depicting us as hysterically feminine and helping us to, quote, transcend the category of woman we somehow got into. And what helps their endeavor? Quote, the master's wand is the charismatic penis. And indeed, one of the most repeated words in no, Nothing Matters is phallus no matter who, whose theory Sommer is discussing. These men are all fellows obsessed. The other repeated theme is that the body is bad and dead, especially women's bodies. Quote, flesh is created by the word of God, not by the body of woman. But, quote, what we are permitted, encouraged and coerced into it is loving the male sex. And the bad girls are the ones who don't love men and who will be punished for it. And this is not entirely true for all these philosophers. Foucault, as a gay man, openly despises women and wants nothing to do with us, and more on that later. So, what does all this postmodern and post-structuralist writing do to or for feminism? 
And by the way, any problems we may have differentiating between post-structuralism and post-modernism is doomed as the boys quarrel amongst themselves about which is which. As Foucault famously said in 1983, what is postmodernism? I am not up to date. Sommer calls the introduction the labyrinth because she refers to the Greek myth where Ariadne, a Cretan princess, um, gives red wool to Theseus who goes and kills the Minotaur who has hidden in a labyrinth. But by allowing him to kill him, Ariadne commits matricide as the Minotaur is her mother's love child. She flees with Theseus, but he dumps her in Naxos. Similarly, Sommer accuses the mainly US feminists who support post-structuralism and postmodernists of matricide. These early POMO poster girls include Linda Nicholson, Susan Heckman, Nancy Fraser, Jane Flax, Linda Alcoff, Chris Whedon, who is a British academic, and Rosie Bridotti, an Australian living in Holland. I am probably not alone here in having tried to read their books, but rarely finished them. Linda Nicholson and Jane Flax both insist that feminist theory belongs in the terrain of postmodern philosophy. Nancy Fraser and Chris Wiedem focus on male theory to, quote, explain female experiences. Rosie Bardotti uses the add women and stir approach that particularly radical feminists have strongly condemned. Susan Heckman's goal is to postmodernize feminism. Feminism must be purged of enlightenment and essential tendencies. She particularly dislikes the women's way of knowing literature. Anything related to women's lives, women experiences, feminist politics, and women's bodies, such as Mary Daly and Audre Lorde's writing, for example, is, quote, distinctly less perfect than Derrida and Foucault, end of quote. Tanya Modleski opposes this view and calls it gynocidal feminism, and it surely is. Some suggest this dilemma might often have been fears by academic women to be left behind, not listened to or silenced if we do not refer to men. Undoubtedly, this is still true today. However, with this comment, she does not justify the work of these anti-feminist writers, but it may explain it. Ignoring daddy is always dangerous, as we know. Chapter one is called A Space Odyssey. This chapter is an exploration of the postmodern universe. And there's a, a quote from someone near the beginning, deconstruction means never having to say you're wrong or a feminist. Derrida says, I'm not against feminism, but I'm simply not for feminism. In my view, by that he means that it has no relevance in the male universe. So see above, postmodern universe. In this chapter, Sommer refers to the work of novelist Alain Robrier, which Simone de Beauvoir described as it's a dead world they are building. Feminists are silenced and punished when they critique postmodernism and its advocates. Monique Plaza at an international symposium in London in 1981 was asked to delete from her paper discussion of the murder by Althusser of his wife, as if the personal were not political. Throughout the book, Sommer identifies the range of ways in which postmodernists show that they hate the body, their own and especially women's bodies. There's a nice summary of Levi Strauss as the main intellectual concerned with structuralism. Sommer's summary is, structure is matter, energy is male, and he, in caps, is the female of form as well. Don't ask me what that means. Um, the word matter has strong etymological links to nata, mother, matrix, measure, material, menstruation, and much more. 
So matter is made into something negative, hence the title of Summer's book, Nothing Matters. <clears throat> First, there was structuralism, very popular among philosophers in the early 1960s, was followed by post-structuralism, which hit its straps after 1968, the year of many political demonstrations on the streets of Paris and elsewhere. So they switched sides, among them Roland Barthes, Jacques Lacan, Michel Foucault, Philippe Soler, and Julia Kristeva were all members of Tel Kel. They became post-structuralists who, post uh, who critiqued modernism. And one of the interesting things about modernism is that there were an enormous number of really fine women writers. Think of Virginia Woolf, Gertrude Stein, Duna Barnes, and Diana Suhami in her 2020 book, No Modernism Without Lesbians, makes that very clear, as did Jill Hanscom and Virginia Somers back in 1987, who wrote Writing for Their Lives, The Modernist Women. But of course, these are never discussed. So the men became post-structuralists who critiqued modernism. And after that came postmodernism, although there is some argument that this is a US label for the same group, that is post-structuralism. Adding in Jean-Francois Lyotard, Jean Baudrillard, Derrida, Foucault and Gilles Deleuze. Sommer writes, postmodernism is theoretical cannibalism a supermarket approach to ideas. And I'd add, it's also a forerunner to globalization. Both emerge from socially mobile males who regard themselves as the intelligentsia. It contains a lot of political disillusionment and is keen on a consumption-oriented lifestyle. Elspeth Pro Proben wrote that postmodernism is the body without organs. And a few pages on, Sommer comments that postmodernism re-legitimates and re-stabilizes masculine traditions of power and prestige, which are always in a state of crisis. In the following pages, she looks briefly at Descartes' cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. In other words, what this means is, I am a completely disconnected, unsocial animal. Why do these men think that they are the centre of the universe? Perhaps because, as Selma says at the end of the chapter, postmodernism is the cultural capital of late patriarchy. And it's a forerunner not only of globalisation, but with its body hatred and fetish about consumption, much of what we see acted out now by transgenderists. Over to you, Renata. Generation. So I starts this chapter with the critique of anthropologist Gail Rubin, who repudiated the female body and material reality in order to develop her us Now Rubin, much better for her anti-feminist embrace of SM and BDSM and other torture methods. Instead of considering radical or even liberal feminist theories, Rubin's he hero is anthropologi anthropologist and structuralist Claude Lévi-Strauss, with some Freud thrown in, who became very famous through his work on kinship. And his one of his famous books is called The Elementary Structure of Kinship. The problem for feminists was and is, as Sommer writes, Quote, that Levi Strauss, Strauss's theoretical society is an abstract, universal, male gendered one without individual male or female subjects. She continues, it is abstract, abstract because it is not material. The relation of kinships are established without birth, meaning without women. We can say that Levi Strauss theory show, but don't acknowledge, a profound phallocentric masculinity. Sommer asks, why do women not exchange men to create a social relationship amongst us? 
similarly to men who in early patriarchal societies began to exchange women, something that Levi Strauss takes for granted. This is an important question because this focus on the nothingness, non-existence of women, matter, matter, is a theme that is repeated amongst all the male theories discussed in Nothing Matters. From, from Rubin, Summer moves on to Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre. De Beauvoir accepts much of Levi Strauss's fault, accepts that man gain transcendence through the exchange of women. As Sommer quips, glad to be of service. But such masculine civilization demands a sacrifice. As Mary O'Brien, important Canadian feminist theorist and supporter of Sommer writes, the male understanding of blood, which is death and discontinuity, triumphs over the female understanding of blood, which is life and integration. Next, Sommer moves on to a discussion of Sartre, the existentialist, and Levi Strauss, which is quite difficult to follow, but may be best summarized as Sommer writes. For Sartre, nothingness is the beginning of authentic existence. And man uses the absurdity of death to struggle and create over and against the hostility of inert matter. But for Levi Strauss, thought is law, not the existential choice of such a subject. As he writes, man is not free to choose whether to be or not to be. From our point of, from our feminist point of view, the main message to take away from these two famous men's disagreement with each other is that, as Sommer puts it, their approaches to matter and nothingness are commonly masculine in orientation and development. Women are largely irrelevant to both men's theory in the same way that they are relevant to Foucault, Derrida, Lacan and others. Perhaps most annoying is that these men seem to not even have been aware of what they were doing. Um, an utterly patronizing misogynist approach to understanding the existence of real women and men and indeed human nature per se. As Sommer writes, Sartre and Levi Strauss turned that tree of life into a hanging post, no new embodiments. This preoccupation with empty, timeless space and the nothing, which is everything, is the post-structuralist, post-modernist, post-coital, post-mortem scene. End of quote. Over to you, Susan. Okay, <laughs> on to chapter three. Existence and death, and the focus of this is Foucault and Nietzsche. Reading this chapter, I was struck by just how masculine the postmodern philosophy is. Not the first time I've had this thought, but it comes out very, very strongly in the works of Louis Althusser, The Wife Strangler, and Michel Foucault. Humanism goes out the door and Foucault is interested in the problem of the relationship of man to the world. Foucault is also interested in the annihilation of the subject. In an interview with Madeleine de Chapsal, in 1966, he is replacing God with man at the centre. An anonymous thought, a knowledge without subject, a theoretical without an identity. And he's distinctly not interested in who is speaking. Women fall outside the speaking circle. Monique Plaza notices this and points out that he quote, defends the interests of his class and acts in solidarity with it, i.e. men. I think immediately of the case of Dominic Pelikov, currently running in France, men defending their interests with other men where rape of an unconscious woman, Giselle Pelikov, is conceived of as justifiable and perfectly okay. Nancy Hartsoff cites Foucault's well-known sentence, power is everywhere and so ultimately 
nowhere. He is a member of the colonising group for whom those oppressed by colonisation are irrelevant. His education shows up in his statement, confession frees, as well as le pouvoir, power doesn't exist. Power becomes pleasure, including perpetual spirals of power and pleasure. In my copy of Nothing Matters, I keep writing rude comments about his ideas, like rubbish, ha-ha, patronising shit. And Summer describes him as condescending and derisive. He's quite open in his contempt for women when, instead of hiring a well-qualified woman for a job in his department, he appoints his male lover and is quoted as saying, non non we don't like old girls. In 2021, it came out that Foucault had been engaging in the abuse of eight and nine-year-old boys in a cemetery near uh, Tunis in Tunisia. So the pedophile colonised disposable bodies and his supporters deny to this day that uh, this ever happened. And there is an article in, El, um, in Al Jazeera, which is among the list of uh, references that we have in a later slide. Foucault died of HIV AIDS, leaving behind his long-term partner, but also a well-documented chain of having unprotected sex with boys, engaging in SM in bathhouses in San Francisco that he frequented. For the differences between these theorists, Selma has a nice summary. For Nietzsche, truth is a woman. For Derrida, life is a woman. For Foucault, death is a woman, or at least a mother. Recall that Freud said, what does woman want? They could all inform themselves by reading radical feminist theory, but of course they would regard that as irrelevant, just like the colonised. Foucault turns to Nietzsche, who German radical feminist Hedwig Dom, 1831 to 1919, wrote that he had nothing more to offer than the common prejudices of his age and his sex. Nietzsche, just like those who followed, was a misogynist. He's quoted as having said that woman was God's second blunder. The first was that animals were not entertaining and so men were bored. So God created woman. Nietzsche distanced himself from the idea that man was an animal and therefore animals should be dominated. For him, woman is just a vessel. The best thing that can happen for, to her is that she bears the superman with a capital S. He loves the idea of immaterial eternity, but it seems children too are boring. He wants to absorb eternity into his own being, which some names as a uterus fetish. We can now see how this becomes a dark labyrinth in which man will remain trapped. It's all about distancing oneself from woman, just as Theseus did by abandoning Ariadne on Naxos, the one who made it possible for Theseus to kill the Minotaur and find his way back out of the labyrinth. According to Nietzsche, only Superman can enter the abyss because he's the most affirmative of men, the male mother. So Nietzsche wants to give birth to eternity by creating an eternal work of art, rather like the wish Socrates expresses when he becomes Diotima's mouthpiece in the symposium. I actually wrote an essay about Di Diotima back in 1982 uh, called Diotima Speaks Through the Body, and it's also in the list of references at the end. Sommer then uh, compares Nietzsche and Dionysus, the twice-born god, first of the pregnant mother Semele, and when she burned to death after Father Zeus revealed himself to her, he saved Dionysus by sticking himself in his thigh for the rest of the pregnancy. Nietzsche sees himself as having a Dionysian endowment. As he says, they all love me. Sounds a bit like Trump. All this contains a desire for destruction. 
change can only ever be regarded as destructive. Soma writes, for what Nietzsche craves is becoming Ariadne is not a gay relationship with Dionysus, but a lesbian one, a lesbian relationship in which he can partner genetically become pregnant with himself. This sounds a bit like a mix between reproductive technology and the fantasies of the transgender cult. Sommer remarks that Nietzsche is using female fetishes to affirm male motherhood. If we look at the origins of patriarchy, and both Mary Bailey and Virginia Woolf point this out, the religious men wear dresses. In pre-patriarchy, the wearing of female garb would make men more accept acceptable to the female spirits, goddesses and priestesses. In some, uh, in, in quite a summer sense of Nietzsche, that he celebrates the rebirth of the masculine sex and death. He dresses as a woman to fool the devouring abyss past. Yet to truly embrace his fate, surely he must face the abyss as a man and not as a god. And in order to become anti-sexist, which of course was not Nietzsche's goal, his postmodern disciples must stop thinking of himself, of him and themselves as gods. Renata. Wow. Now we're moving into chapter four, which is called Neutrality and the slash meaning, the meaning. And it is mainly about Derrida. Uh, I always thought that Foucault was the worst, but I think after reading Nothing Matters Again, I think Derrida gets the, gets the prize. So um, Sommer begins this chapter by discussing the rift between the Derrida, who is Jewish, and Foucault, who is Catholic. Derrida was a student and a friend of Foucault, but in 1963, he fundamentally criticized Foucault's 673-page treatise on madness and civilization in a public lecture, which Foucault attended. This damaged a friendship which never recovered. Derrida's critique of Foucault was firstly, that he had badly misunderstood the first three pages of Descartes and the Cartesian Cogito. And secondly, and more importantly, that he, Derrida, focused on the texts themselves, which he deconstructed, whereas Foucault allowed for a historical and archaeological reading and interpretation. Derrida also accused Foucault, somewhat bizarrely, I think, of claiming that he understood what madness was, an impossibility if you focus on text without context, as Derrida does. For him, there was no such thing as meaning. Foucault, of course, rejected Derrida's comments, which he called, quote, a remark remarkable critique, and in no two subtle words began to slag him off. Their fights goes on over a few pages in this chapter, but I'll leave it for you to read that yourself in Nothing Matters. It is just another example of how these fathers of post-structuralism, post-modernism devoted an amazing amount of their time to quarreling about themselves among themselves. Derrida became very famous and became known as the father of deconstruction, which did not seem to please him as he rejected it. His writing, even in this chapter, is difficult to make sense of, something that was widely noted. For instance, when Cambridge University wanted to give him an honorary doctor doctorate in philosophy, he actually never finished his own PhD. A large group of academics objected, saying that, quote, his works employ a written style that defies comprehension. And, quote, many have been willing to give Monsieur Derrida the benefit of the doubt in insisting that language of such depth and difficulty of interpretation must have deep and subtle thoughts indeed. When the effort is made to penetrate it, however, it becomes clear to us at least that where coherent assertions are being made at all, these are either false or trivial. He still got his doctor awarded. The 
this criticism made me feel a bit better because I too had problems understanding what Derrida wrote. And as, as an aside, I think brought somewhere broadly writing a PhD and then after this this book on these French boys must have be must be given a huge prize for determination and sticking it out and I'm not sure I would have lasted. Anyway, what has the Derrida to say about women? Not much that will please us. Mary O'Brien commented beautifully, Levi Strauss tried to convince women we are spoken, exchanged like words. Lacan, who we'll get to in the next chapter, tried to teach women we can't speak because the phallus is the original signifier. And then Derrida says that it doesn't matter. It's just talk. Derrida says that woman, quote, is a name for that untruth of truth and uses, quote, the words hymen and woman as slippery metaphors for his stylish play with non-meaning. The untruth of truth. I'm still puzzling over this, actually. Like Nietzsche, Derrida believes that only men should speak of woman. As Sommer writes, Derrida holds that femininity or female sexuality are the essentializing fetishes of the dogmatic philosopher. So much of this can be re related to transgender stuff. It's really interesting. As he continued having a dig at, and, sorry, and he continued having a dig at feminists. For it is the man who believes in the truth of woman, in woman truth. And in truth, they too are men, those women feminists so derided by Nietzsche. Feminism is nothing but the operation of a woman who aspires to be like a man. And in order to resemble the masculine dogmatic philosopher this woman lies claim, just as much claim as he to truth, science and objectivity in all the castrated delusions of virility. Feminism, too, seeks to castrate. It wants a castrated woman. There you have it. Whatever this garbled statement may mean, it appears that Monsieur Derrida is no friend of feminism or feminists. But Derrida goes further. As Soma notes, Derrida then claims to speak our truth, women's true, true, true truth, which is, quote, Woman has no truth, no essence. I mean, before we had an untruth in truth, so there you go. To search for a woman, to search for truth is to seek an essence, a fixi fixity, an ontology, and a metaphysics. Woman should not believe in herself. When a female student tries to confront him in a colloquium, he silences her and doubles down, quoting Nietzsche. Quote, we, this is from Nietzsche. We men wish that women should not go on compromising herself through enlightenment. Just it was man's thoughtfulness and consideration for woman that found in pre expression in the church decree, mulier tatiat in ecclesia, women shall up in the church. It was for women's good when Napoleon gave the all too clever Madame de Stael to understand mulier, mulier tatiat in politicis, woman shut up in politics. And I think it is a real friend of women that counsels them today, mulier tatiat, tatiat de muliere, women shut up about other women. Summer comments that Derrida too admonishes us not to speak about our lives, our sexuality, our desire for emancipation. And in fact, Lacan agrees. When women speak about women, women, they don't know what they are saying, which is, <laughs> which is all the difference between them and me. I mean, it's funny many times to even read what this, these men saying, they're so up themselves. Such women-hating pronouncements continue, but I will spare you the details. At the end of this chapter, Derrida is revealed as a sadistic misogynist who even uses the shocking murder of Columbine by her husband, Piero, in a story by Stéphane Mallarmé, who is a well-known French poet. 
when he says, using the language of batterers, quote, it is the hymen that desires dreams of piercing, of bursting in an act of violence that is, brackets, at the same time or somewhere between love and murder. Sommer concludes these thoughts on Derrida by commenting that, quote, he finds neutrality, nothing matters, moves to everything is permitted. There is presence, masculine dominance, end of quote. And just to finish, when I looked up this vile man on Wikipedia, it said he was good looking, he was born in Algiers and enjoyed enormous popularity. In fact, he got close to being a TV star. But then I guess in the age of Trump, nothing should shock us about famous misogynist men who are popular. Over to Susan. Chapter 5, Lacan and Irigaray, Ethical Lack and Ethical Presence. Let me begin with saying that I have many reservations about Freudian psychoanalysis on which the ideas of Lacan are built. Sommer writes that for Lacan, analytical experience has discovered the circle of obligation and guilt in desire a circle which is imposed upon us. She then goes on to quote Lacan writing about sin. Subsequently, uh, as Sommer writes, quote, meaning is never arrived at, it never comes to anything. So we have a meaningless circularity founded on masculine experience, thought and culture. She discusses the role of sadism, building on the ideas of Freud and Dessart, and the idea that one will glimpse the face of God in other people's pain, or what Kate Millett describes as the death part. She discusses the Freudian idea that the phallus is the primordial signifier, but you only have to go to a few archeological museums to see that this is not the case. Male figures rarely appear in the early archaeological evidence that everyone believes this ship. By the vulva, by contrast, is regarded as, quote, a void and void of meaning. Why? Because it does not have a penis in it. Even in Freud's time, the archaeological evidence pointed to that. There are books by Jane Ellen Harrison, um, a, a scholar of ancient uh, Greece in the first uh, years of the 20th century. And even HD, the poet, who was analyzed by Freud, also kicked back against this interpretation. And by the time Lacan was developing his ideas, the evidence was clear cut. That is evident in the work of Luce Irigaray who was expelled from the Lacanian school in 1974. She also lost her teaching position after the publication of her book, Speculum of the Other Woman. While Kristeva continued on her libertarian way, she wrote, I have never experienced that slave mentality. Uh, to me, this sounds rather like Ayn Rand and others of her school. Sommer concludes, that Lacanian analysis is the theory that women must do what men want and be silent. <coughs> and she quotes from Nietzsche, the men's happiness is I will, the woman's happiness is he will. In Speculum of the Other Woman, Uruguay writes, speech is never neutral and goes on to show how language is sex. In her book, The Sex Which Is Not One, she writes uh, that we women, we are women from the start. We don't have to be turned into women by them, labelled by them, made holy and profaned by them. In contrast to Nietzsche, Freud and Lacan, in 1987, she wrote, in the beginning, divine truth was communicated to women, transmitted from mother to daughter. But she does not take this idea any further. And I think she's more concerned with the idea of reciprocity by men, which 
is an unachievable aim in my view. And while I have something of a soft spot for Iridore, in the end, she fails women because her philosophy is still full of men, desire for men, and an inability to see that sisters can do it for themselves. This is most clearly seen in the writings of Monique Vitti, whose work she must have known and read. Iridore writes that it's necessary for a female people to have its own symbols, laws, and gods. But women have done this. Lesbians in particular have done this in imaginative ways. And I am here thinking of uh, Monique Vitti and Australian artist Suzanne Bellamy uh, when I write, write this. I've also worked towards this, doing this, especially in my poetry. But neither men nor, it seems, most heterosexual women can listen to what lesbians have to say. As Sommer writes, cultural representation of a female gene gene genealogy is Irigaray's political project for women's liberation. The heterosexual creation of the world is her ethics. And Sommer contrasts this with the work of Sarah Richie and Hogan's book, Lesbian Ethics Towards a New Value, uh, that was published in 1988. While at significant cost to herself, Irigare stepped well away from Lacan's theories, but she still believes in the man-woman dyad. Sommer writes, it is closet hysteria. She's forgotten the politics of sexual difference. Reader, she married him. Under the name of L'Equiteur Feminine, Hélène Cizou is launched with her famous article, The Laugh of the Medusa. Sommer suggests that she should take a course in women's studies and some Anglophone feminists should resolve their colonial mentalities. It is because Cizou is fascinated by male authors. She believes that women have not made discoveries. But that's not true. And I was thinking of the astrophysicist, Cecilia Payne in 1925, discovered that stars were mainly made up of hydrogen, a huge discovery. Vera Rubin in the 1970s found that dark matter comprises most of the matter in the universe. Jocelyn Bell from Northern Ireland in 1967 discovered the first radio pulsars. And of course, there are many, many other uh, such women. So to say that women have not made discoveries and outer space is one of the few places anybody can make discoveries these days uh, is just not true. With a lot of struggle, women have moved into the male domain, but woman is now a career open to men. Just as uh, Summer wrote about the professionalization earlier, it is a career that allows management of women in the workplace, such as she experienced. The chapter ends with Summer's comment, quote, how to write psychoanalytic critiques without authority. That is her, the postmodern feminist's dilemma in the empty space between feminism and in psychoanalysis, where the only role for the bearded woman is to criticize hysterics. So, in other words, I say, the door, to, the door to the boys' club has been slammed shut. Renata. Now we're getting to the end, and I know that time is uh, going on as well. Uh, the last chapter is called Out of Oblivion. What we face today in the shape of transgenderism and transhumanism is the total disconnect from real bodies and ignorance of biology. This is evident in the reification of immateriality. And Sommer discusses at length an exhibition held in Paris by Lyotard entitled Les Immateriaux, the immaterials uh, at the Centre Georges Pompidou in 1985. The exhibition is a dematerialized electronic environment, a great disruption of the senses. If we go back to the meaning of matter, matrix, mother, and consider the implication of dematter, dematrix, demother, it is easy to see what Leotard intends. In his language game, as part of the exhibition, it says, quote, you detest being a man, 
biochemistry and surgery can make you the body of a woman, written in 1985. Recall that Summer was the Finn Rage contact for Canada. She writes, quote, in postmodern genesis, the word creation is absolute through techni technique. It, its matrix is the in, in determ in determinacy of life and death, the exchangeability of subjects, the causal commercialization of human material and its rigid scientific control. None of postmodernism's commentators have recognized how re reproductive technologies and genetic engineering is its spermatic economy and mainstream culture, its regimes of accumulation and signification. It originates in a masculine crisis to re-legitimate patriarchal power, filiation and articulation. It pretends there will be a brave new world which will find new materials to eternalize patriarchal power in a postmodern culture where life is simply the time which is not yet this. Half-lives of the immaterial. These are the phallic these signs which postmodernism disseminates. I think that's a fabulous uh, comment by Sommer. That Sommer recognizes the connection between Leotard and the growth of the trans ideology is shown in her citing of Janice Raymond's The Transsexual Empire, which is obviously written in 1979. Um, so I'm just going to give, uh, to finish up some quotes uh, from Sommer's book, Death and Matricide or Life and Birth. The first is the core of postmodern epistemology the other is the matrix of materialist radical feminist theory. Another quote, postmodernism is the philosophy appropriate to the new reproductive technologies and for the disarticulation of feminist politics. What a great word, the disarticulation of feminist politics. And the final quote, which points to the post-humanist intent purged of the female procreative body by an operation of reversal, brackets, the scientist becomes genetrix, then displacement through extra uterine pregnancy and indetermination, the manipulation and exchangeability of genetic material. Freed from the fixed identity of our bodies, we, can float like transcendental signifiers in spaceships, extraterrestrial self-made men at last. We highly commend Summer Broderib's spirited and prescient takedown of the male death cult of postmodernism. Not an easy read, but highly rewarding. And that's- And maybe Joe, you could put the last- uh... Uh, the last uh, uh, slide up with the references that we have used. So Joe, been basically, yeah, Joe has posted them in the in the chat. Uh, so, but there oh, they okay. are. All right. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, I hope <laughs> you got something out. Is it was. Quite a difficult read, I have to say. Uh, it was good that Susan and I did it together so we could really, you know, work together. But I really encourage you to uh, have a, to read it and buy it. And we reprinted it in 2022, so it's available everywhere on the Amazons and in our distribution places and, of course, on the SpinFX website itself. And, you know, we have to know what what the theorists say um, if we really want to um, ha have a go at discussing them. And a lot of women never took the time to do that. And Summer did the hard work for us. And so we have to thank her again very, very much for this. Um, Joe, could you put up the last slide, which is the one with the uh, the astrophysicists, women astrophysicists, Cecilia Payne, Vera Rubin, Jocelyn Bell. Just look them up on Wikipedia and find out all sorts of incredible stuff about them. 
So I really enjoyed doing this in spite of it being difficult and I've been very pleased to do this tonight and I'm so sorry that my um, sound didn't work very well at the beginning. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Susan Hawthorne and Renata Klein. That was incredibly interesting and I think has saved me a couple of years of bothering to read all these horrible uh, postmodernists and to know that we can read this book by Summer Brodrib is amazing but the the webinar really clearly showed us um, some of the problems or many of the problems with these writers so um, hopefully see everybody next week and I suppose the last thing I'd like to say is if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, do go to Spin Effects Press because there are loads of other books apart from this one um, that will be very interesting for you. And of course, come back. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.